this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Steve Olsher. He's New York Times bestselling author of What Is Your What? He also talks about the early days when he co-founded San Francisco-based Liquor.com and also launched one of the first wine and spirits store on CompuServe back in 93. That and much more coming up next. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Steve Olsher. Welcome, Steve. Hey, bud. How are you? Steve is the New York Times bestselling author of What Is Your What? Discover the one amazing thing you were born to do. We all need to hear what he has to say about this. I love the DNA on the side of the, the cover. That's great. Thank you. Um, he's also the co-founder and chairman of San Francisco-based Liquor.com. It's a great domain. He launched the first wine and spirit store on CompuServe in 1993, and he launched one of the internet's first fully functional e-commerce websites in 1995, Liquor by Wire. So he knows what he's doing. That is just to name a few companies he started because there's a laundry list of them. Steve, it's great to have you here. Yeah, man. Thanks again. Um, you know. Oftentimes, we learn our most valuable lessons when we make mistakes. And simply put, Steve, we want to hear with your experience what's worked, what didn't work. And I'm excited to hear some of the big lessons you learned. Um, I also like to start off with a fun fact. Um, fun fact about Steve is don't mess with him because he's a brown belt <laughs> in jujitsu. Do you still do you still? Uh, do you that? know, I um I've certainly slowed down my training. I, uh, I trained under Carlson Gracie Sr. when the old man was still alive, and uh, then under Carlson Gracie Jr. before and after that. So, um, you know, man, I'm uh, I'm 43 going on 44. So nowadays I, I look at the mats and I get injured, you know, man. So it's uh, <laughs> it's not, not quite the same game as it used to be. <laughs> Another fun fact which I loved hearing is you started something called the Funky Pickle. Tell us about that. So Funky Pickle was uh, really my first legit entrepreneurial endeavor where it was a, well, it was a non-alcoholic nightclub that was smack dab in the middle of Southern Illinois University at Carbondale's alcohol-suffused nightlife. And, uh, and so, you know, man, it's, uh, it's one of those things where I really felt like there was an opportunity. I had been DJing for a number of years and had built up a pretty good following. thought there was an opportunity to build my own club and had never done anything of that nature before but obviously at 20 years of age i knew it couldn't be alcohol laden so it was the idea was to create a non-alcohol club where we could cater to the teenagers early uh close down clean up and then we'd reopen for the adults 18 and over and because we didn't serve booze we could literally stay open as long as we wanted often till four five six in the morning as we did uh, and you know, reality is that it was uh, it was a really amazing learning experience, both about people and business and money and uh, you know just everything that goes hand in hand with actually getting in the game. So, what were some of the big lessons? You're a young entrepreneur at that time. What are some big lessons or things you wish you would have known at that time? You know, I'm I'm not sure that there was anything that I could have known or would have done differently in hindsight. I mean, certainly as you get older, you get smarter, but what I, what I do believe is that, you know, when you look back on your life, you're, you're most going to regret failing to act than taking action and realizing what those weak minded people term as failure, because in reality, failure doesn't exist. I mean, it's really just one of those terms Mm -hmm. of ignorance that those, Weak-minded folk like to throw out at those who dare to soar in an attempt to bring them down. And so um, I think had I not done the club, I would have learned probably just as much as having done it. But I say that from the standpoint of I would have learned uh, really that there there are certain things in life that you're just absolutely going to regret not doing. And uh, and that would have been one of them. Yeah. I mean, most 20-year-olds would be like, you know, I have this good idea. It sounds good. And they may not have followed through with it. What caused you at that time to actually do it? Uh, you know, I can't take full credit for just ramping it up and saying, hey, this is what I have to do. I was actually talking to a uh, friend of mine, who, a golf coach, 
believe it or not, who was more of a mentor to me than anything else. And, you know, we were chatting about the idea and I had told him that I thought it was a good idea, but he said, you know, what, what are you afraid of? What, what do you think is going to happen here? Right. And, and so it was just kind of gave me pause and I began to think about really what my fears were. And those were, you know, I'm afraid of losing money. I'm afraid of looking bad. I'm afraid I won't be able to recover. I'm afraid people will just, you know, laugh until the cows come home about someone who tried to do something and it didn't work, et cetera. And, and he said to me, you know, just, just remind me now what it is that you're doing, uh, you know, for money, right? What, what are you doing right now for money? And I told him I was waiting tables. I was DJing. I was pumping gas. I was doing, you know, pretty much whatever I had to do to make ends meet. And he said, look, man, you know, if things don't work out with the club, you can always go back to pumping gas. And, you know, you just have thousands of conversations over the years. And it was one of those lines that's really stuck with me all this, all this time. And, and I really did take that to heart. And, and I think in a large measure, I really owe him uh, a huge thank you <laughs> before, for saying that. Because it's true, there are certain skills that you have that you can always fall back on. And when push comes to shove. Uh, you can figure out how to put bread on the table. Yeah. That's a good tweetable. You can always go back to pumping gas. I like that. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. that's what's going through most people's minds. So it's good to hear from you and kind of you had to get over those those uh, early things. What were the early days like of, because you launched one of the internet's first fully functional e-commerce websites. Tell us yeah. about that. So, um, you know, I've always been just one of those early to the game uh you know, type people. And I, I just, I heard about the internet, um, thought it might be something that we should explore. And, but even before the internet, I mean, there was this big CompuServe and AOL battle going on and just, you know, really felt like it was, uh, um, you know, it was a, a game that I had to get into. So, uh, just, I, you know, man, I had a catalog company at the time and just, was looking at another revenue stream for the catalog company, and uh, and it seemed like electronic commerce was uh, was one of the things to 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 do, right? So that's that's what I did. What were some of the pitfalls early on? Because when you're first to game, there's not all the kinks that worked out. Well, you know, I mean, look, CompuServe was a whole different animal at the time. I mean, we literally had to go to Columbus and get trained on how to put things onto the electronic mall and how to process orders. And it was just, it was really my first foray into cutting my teeth um, into the online game. And, you know, I, I think CompuServe was learning as they, as they went along, as was AOL and, uh, you know, and everyone else who was trying to figure out this whole internet, interconnectivity, you know, type space. Yeah. So when did liquor.com come into play? So, Liquor.com came into play in 1998 because we had built up Liquor by Wire into a pretty decent catalog and online business and thought that the .com, Liquor.com, would be, um, you know, more on point to, to what we were doing because it was all about worldwide gift delivery of wine and champagne, spirits, and gift baskets. Uh, and, and so track the domain down to a fairly young kid in California. Really? And, uh, and he owned bourbon.com as well. And uh, so I was able to negotiate the terms to buy both for $7,500. Holy cow, and, are you serious? Uh, yep, and thought that was uh, a good idea. And at the time, it was a lot of money. You know, I mean, it was, it was a lot of money, but I thought, uh, I thought it made sense. And uh, and certainly that that helped in our transition towards uh, the dot com era. So what are the, some of the big lessons you learned from running the premium domain liquor dot com? Well, first and foremost, I learned as I learned the hard way uh, is that when you have a business that gains any degree of recognition, it begins to take on a life of its own, some for the good, some for the bad. And in our case, we kind of got caught up in the whole dot-com hype. And we felt like, look, we got a great domain. At the time, we were doing about $3 million in sales. So this was more than just an idea on a napkin. I mean, it was like, you know, a real company. The heavy lifting had been done, right? I mean, we were, we were in position to really grow this thing. We just needed money, right, for marketing to spread the word. 
And so we kind of got blinded by that whole dot com like because there were companies that literally were getting millions of dollars in funding with basic ideas on a napkin. You know, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of how the, the atmosphere was in 98, 99. And so by 99, I kind of just said, hey, you know, we're, we're in this game and, and we, should be, we should be one of those players. And so literally uh, within a couple of months, we had signed on a, um, a team of, of folks to take us into venture capital land and uh, literally had signed away management rights because we had been convinced that uh, Wall Street wanted to see more gray hairs and we needed more seasoned people. So literally signed away management rights to the company. And when we had the S-1 filed and we were ready to go public in March of 2000, that's when everything imploded. And so it became very clear that we weren't going to get out. It became very clear that uh, I had made a huge mistake by signing away management rights to the company. And uh, within six months, I was gone, just literally walked away from everything, including the domain, and had nothing to show for the nine years of work. Wow. Holy crap. So what do you yep. do at that point? I mean, that's, you say that kind of, a matter of fact, but at, the, at that point, it must have been really, really hard. You know, it was, but I, I didn't have time to think too much about it. We had bought a three flat in 1998. Uh, and if you remember around 2000, late 2000, the, uh, the real estate boom had really started to, to take on a life of its own. And so now we had these two interesting markets uh, really just burgeoning where you had the dot-com world and then you had the real estate world. Of course, the dot-com world then imploded uh, in 2000, which is what happened to us. And, and I came home. I uh, literally remember sitting on my doorstep thinking, you know, how am I going to tell my wife that I just walked away from everything, no paycheck, no anything. Um, but we did have a three flat. We had income coming in. We were literally making money every month instead of having a mortgage. So I knew that we wouldn't be in terrible shape. Um, but I did also know that I had to do something. So literally in looking at the three flat and hearing stories of people making money in real estate, I, I mean, literally I, the next day I started looking for real estate type transaction endeavor, something that I could do in the real estate space. And, uh, and immediately jumped uh, on that bandwagon. So then you had a real estate company. So what mm -hmm. were some of the, and you ran that for how long? Well, I still have some oh, okay. property that I own to this day. Uh, we specialized in adaptive reuse, which means taking an old building and making it better. So those were the types of buildings that I focused on. Interestingly enough, after I sat on my door, you know, my porch there by the doorstep there and, uh, and, and tried to figure out what to do next and had thought about getting into real estate. I, I ended up putting together a plan to buy a building, which was an apartment building, a seven unit building, uh, and convert that to condominiums in the Palmer Square neighborhood of Chicago. And you probably know that neighborhood being from the area here. And, um, and our model unit actually opened up on September 10th, 2001. <laughs> so if you uh, if you remember timing, then you'd remember that that was uh, not good timing. <laughs> not good timing because September 11th, of course, was the day. Right. And uh, fortunately, the real estate market recovered, and we were able to sell out of that building. But you know, timing really is um, can be a mother. You know, I want to go back to that time that you had to walk away and you started the real estate because mo most people they may be. You know, some people may be at that point now, and it sounded like you bounced back pretty quickly. What What do you draw on at time like a low point like that to just push forward to the next thing and forget about you know, what you were just doing? You know, have you ever have you ever moved where you live, or have you lived in the same house for your whole life? No, I moved. Yeah. Have you ever lived in a different city or a different country? Sure. Okay, so. Have you ever have you ever moved permanently away from a particular city? Yeah, you have. OK, yeah. so um, so I ask that because, you know, with rare exception, when you move, when you physically move from one house to another or one city to another city or one country to another country, you know, rarely do you look back and go, man, I really miss that place. You know, it's like sometimes you, you may have an inkling here or there, but for the most part, 
you know, it's like good riddance, you know, you just, you move on and, and it's just, you know, you're in a new place now. And so for me, I think the long answer to your question is that it's just, it's not in my DNA to sit there and, and just really sulk. I mean, don't get me wrong. I was pissed. I was disappointed. I was frustrated. I was upset. Uh, you know, all the adjectives you can come up with, with regards to, uh, what happened with liquor by wire and liquor.com i mean it was it was frustrating but at the same token the dna uh of being an entrepreneur is pretty much wired into my system i mean that's that's just how i'm built and so i can't just sit around and do nothing i mean i can do it for periods of time but for the most part uh you know i, I can't just keep going down that path right you know that makes sense and it kind of goes into what is your what in a sense you know just kind of figuring out what what to do and what your passion is. Um, and I'm wondering about your DNA, right? Because some people would have gone through that situation. They would have gotten depressed or not pushed forward. And do you think it's from you starting these businesses from early on and just having that entrepreneur you know, in your DNA? Or is it something from your childhood that your parents did with you that allowed you to, to think like that? Well, one of my first mentors was my grandfather. I mean, he was an entrepreneur mm -hmm. since his early days, and you're from Chicago, or at least you know the Chicago area, so you're probably familiar with Foremost Liquor Stores, um, and Foremost actually was uh, a company that my grandfather started, so, oh. uh, so very familiar with uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. Now, I will say that a lot of what gives me the ability to move forward uh, when times don't go as as planned is that you know I really do believe that there is no such thing as failure I view failure as success with an unintended ending it's just you know things just don't go exactly as planned it doesn't mean you're a failure it just simply means that things didn't come quite you know go you know to pass as you may have hoped that they would and, and that's the reality you know, a lot of people have fear and my acronym for fear is forget everything about reality. And, and that's kind of what happens is, you know, things never go as good as you, you hope they will or as poorly as you're afraid they might. It's always going to be kind of somewhere right in the middle. And, you know, again, it kind of goes back to the whole, you know, what are you going to hold on to? And in the book, what is your what I talk about, the personality traits and the characteristics that you embody you know, being really a direct reflection of what I call your life altering moments. And so whatever character traits are that you embody and you demonstrate on a consistent basis are going to be directly reflective of the internal dialogue that you have about the events that have transpired. So it's up to you. I mean, whatever that dialogue is, is completely your choice and you're going to be uh, a complete reflection of that state of mind. So Steve, tell us about the journey of what is your what. When did you decide to actually that you were going to write the book? Because you've written other books before on various topics. Yeah. So, you know, my, my journey, my wake-up call really took place about four and a half years ago now. Um, what happened to me is I was with my stepfather, who was very much a father. I mean, he raised me since I was 10. Uh, I was with him in his final days as he was on his deathbed. And um, he could no longer communicate verbally, but I believe that we were able to connect through the point of physical touch because uh, while I was holding his hand during his final days, I had a vision of my funeral, not of his funeral, but actually of mine. And I believe that he was somehow sending me this vision because... I could hear the words being spoken graveside as I was laying in that dark, damp casket, literally being lowered into the earth. Uh, I mean, I could hear the words, which were, here lies Steve Ulsher. He dedicated his life to chasing the almighty dollar. And that's all that was said. And, you know, it really did hit me hard because I do believe that my stepfather was really saying, hey, you know, this is your inevitable fate unless you change course, that you can have meaningful impact in this world on this world but for now you know your life is really of meaning to you and those closest to you but really no one else and so that's when I, I really took those words to heart and began examining where I was and began thinking about the legacy that I want to leave and it became clear to me that 
the legacy that I was forging to that point was not going to enable me, empower me to affect not only those who share this lifetime with me in a meaningful way, but also those of lifetimes to come. And so I've always had sort of this nagging, you know, kind of tugging at my collar type feeling that I was meant and made to do something extraordinary, but I really never knew what that was or how to, how to find it. And so as I searched and began looking for tools that could help me, uh, most of the stuff really left me with more questions than answers. And so I began putting pen to paper to share some of the tips and strategies and shortcuts and tools that have worked well for me in my life in the hope of potentially helping others. And that's where it became clear that I've got an intuitive gift for creating this framework as you find in what is your what, uh, for helping people identify what their answer is to the question of, you know, really what, what is it that I'm here to do? How am I naturally wired to excel? And mm -hmm. the framework that I created involves three specific parts of the equation, which are identifying your natural gifts, the people that you're most compelled to serve, and the vehicle you use to share those gifts with the world. And it's those three elements that then solve the equation or answer the question of what is your what. So it's been about a four and a half year process. How did you know that was going to be in the form of a book as opposed to kind of coaching or, or some other avenue? Uh, I didn't, you know, I mean, reality is I didn't know what format it would take. Uh, I, I did know that writing for me came naturally. And I recently wrote a blog post, which is, uh, you can find it on steveolsher.com, and the, uh, the blog post is titled, It Wasn't Me. And when I write, it's almost as if, I don't want to say that I'm channeling someone, but I don't know where these ideas come from. I mean, I really don't know. I don't know where the framework came from. I don't know where any of this comes from. And I'd be, I'd be naive to think that I can take full credit for everything that comes to the surface. But when I write, the ideas flow. And so it just made natural sense for those ideas to flow into a book as that whole process began to formulate and formalize uh, over time. Yeah. So what else should people know from the book? Obviously, they should check out what is your what. What else should people know from the book that would be um, kind of leave them going in the right direction? Like you said, some books kind of leave you more questions than answers. Yeah. I think that the endorsements speak for themselves. I mean, when people like Jack Canfield, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul and Success Principles, and David Allen, who wrote Getting Things Done, and uh, you know John Acuff of Start, and you know many many others have said that this is this is a game changing book. Uh, you know, it, it's to not. I can't. I mean, I can sit here and toot my own horn and tell you that you know this is something that you have to pick up and it's going to change your life, but. You know, I think the 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 hundred and forty plus Amazon five star reviews that we have and and so on and the endorsements uh, that that we have for the book, you know, certainly speak volumes more than anything that I can say. But I will tell you that you know, reality for me is that, and this is what one of my circle of ten coaching clients, Andrea Robinson, said. You know, it took her almost sixty years to realize that she is the solution to someone else's problem. And that's what I encourage you to think about, is what solutions do you offer to someone else's problem? And the reality is that, you know, it doesn't matter the size of the stage, it doesn't matter the, the success or adoration that you receive. I mean, even a small pebble dropped in a large body of water will create ripples that eventually reach the shore. So you just got to get in the game. You got to figure out what it is that you're compelled to do, who you're compelled to serve, and how you're going to share those gifts. And once you're in the game, you are going to change people's lives. And that's the most important thing any of us can possibly do while we're here. Yeah. I mean, also, there's one thing creating a powerful material piece of you know a book like what is your what and there's another in actually getting out in the market and getting people to to read it and you've become a best-selling author author what's some of the pitfalls or lessons you learned to get because that wasn't an easy journey either i mean you had to write the book then you had to actually get it out to people what were some of the things you did yeah. to to do that yeah and honestly i mean this is my third book 
Uh, and so it's taken me this long to end up with a mainstream publisher. Uh, so Wiley is the publisher on What Is Your What, which is you know, a far cry from the first book that I put out, which was self-published. But you know, in terms of what, what I can offer, look, it, it's, uh, it's a matter of just being willing to be polarizing. I, mean, I think ultimately you have to you have to get people to line up on either side of you. I mean, they're either going to love you or they're going to hate you, but they damn well better know that you were here. So why right? do people hate you? It seems like a good message. What is your what? Uh, it is, except, you know, it, believe it or not, it, there are people who don't believe in the concept. There are people who just don't believe that everyone is entitled to create an existence where they can do something they love, something they're good at, and get paid extraordinarily well to do it. As one of the uh, reviewers uh, of the book said, uh, you know, someone's still got to take out the garbage, right? And so, you know, there are people who subscribe to the notion that they are here to take out the garbage, and that's as far as they can go, and that's what they're meant to do, right? Or that's their only option. It's not what they're meant to do, but really that's what their only option is. And, you know, I mean, that kind of dialogue saddens me, but those people get mad at me. You know, when I tell them they're morons, you know, for being, you know, fucking idiots, really for sitting around saying that, you know, where they're at in life is where they choose to be, and they say, no, I don't choose to be here at all. You know, I mean, you can only beat someone in the head with a rock so many times before they're just going to crack open and bleed to death. So, you know, reality is that not everybody gets it. Not everybody resonates with the message. Not everybody believes that they're entitled to do something uh, that's pretty fucking amazing. Yeah. So you, you say that it's just you have so much passion for it. Is that why you think it's polarizing? Just because, oh. you know, the, you know, just... That comes through. Obviously, you want them to do something greater with their lives. So I do. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad, you know, I'm happy. If, if, they, if they're content with how they live their lives, who am I to say otherwise? But what, all I can tell you is that, you know, from my perspective, you've got two choices in life. And you can either be a critic or you can be a creator. And people who are watching this right now, they're being critics, right? Maybe it will lead to them being a creator, but... You know, they're thinking, why does that guy have a blue and white background? Why didn't he shave for the interview? Why is Steve wearing a sweater? Why couldn't he wear black headbuds instead of white headbuds so it didn't clash? You know, I mean, it's like, it's just it's just the, the natural byproduct of being a human being is we, we like to criticize. It's what we do. And so my challenge for people is to figure out how to be a, be a creator and put something forth for the world to judge, not because they have to, but simply because they want to. Right. I mean, I don't know. I would think the audience who are listening to this, who want to better themselves and develop, maybe that goes through their mind for a second, maybe not. But I think the more searching for, you know, what their underlying passion is, how they can take your words and go, you know, get to the next level. You know, I was talking, went to dinner with a high level entrepreneur last night. He does really well and he's still looking for, you know, that thing that he's passionate about that it cool, may not be call me. Yeah. <laughs> Give my number. But I mean, look, reality is and and what what I will tell you is that so in the book, in the book I've got um there's a lot of case studies, right? So it's not always easy to figure out exactly what to do and how to do it. And so what I've done is created a number of case studies. And the case studies, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not, but they kind of they kind of look like this where you've got a bio about the person, what they're doing, how they got to where they are now, and then you've got their equation. How do they complete their equation of their gifts, the vehicle, and the people they're most compelled to serve? And then there's a, an all-encompassing sort of guiding statement. And Larry Winget is one of the people that I interviewed for the book. And Larry's a great guy, writes all sorts of interesting books, including Shut Up, Stop Wanting, and Get a Life, Grow a Pair, and you know, you're, you're broke because you want to be, and these, you know, these sort of books. That's polarizing, yeah. Very polarizing. Um, and so what he says, and I wholeheartedly agree, is that the people that are his fans and the people that read his books and the people that connect with them are people who are ready for radical change. And so if you're ready to discover your what, if you're ready to bring your life to that next level, then I'm your man, right? I mean, that's then I'm part of the conversation. If you're not ready 
or you know you just don't believe that it's possible you don't subscribe to the notion you're not my guy you know you're not my girl it's just that's the reality and so you can't try to please everyone period and trying to do so you know gets you absolutely nowhere i'm very targeted i take it like a sniper and the people who are ready for my message and want to work with me are those who are ready to have meaningful impact significant impact on those that share this lifetime with them and those of lifetimes to come. So in, in someone being ready, is it more of a mindset or more you look at someone who is taking certain action? Like let's say someone has a full-time job and they want to start a business and they haven't done it yet, but they're putting, you know, at what point I guess would, would you consider them being ready for you? Let's say. So, so there's two answers to that question. And remind me of the second answer, which is moment in time. So keep that in, keep that in mind because I have a tendency to ramble. So just remember those three words. Sure. The, the second answer to the question um, is, is that you, you can't be an idiot about this stuff. I mean, you, you just can't up and quit your day job. I mean, you, you got to understand that even though you're ready to discover what it is that you're truly compelled to do, you can't just quit your day job and, and – throw that Kevin Costner bullshit in the mix where, you know, if you, if you build it, they will come. It doesn't work that way, right? I mean, you have got to be willing to enter into the transition where right now 100% of your income is derived from what you don't want to do. 0% of your income is derived from what you do. So as soon as you leap into the field of, of being a creator and get in the game and put something forth for the world to judge and, you know, God forbid, ask someone to buy it and that first dollar comes in, that's when that recipe mixture starts to shift. And as more and more of your income is derived from what it is that you're truly compelled to do, you'll know when it's time to cut that rope. I mean, you may need 50% of your current income to do so. You may need 80%. You may need 100% of your current income to fully cut the rope. But ultimately, it's about understanding what the ultimate objective is, where you're going and laying out that plan of action for getting there. And once you have that prize sort of in, 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 your, in your scope, you know, there's nothing that's going to stop you from, from – I mean, you can just be like an 18-wheeler going downhill, you know, the, through the mountains without any brakes, right? I mean, it's just, the only one who can stop that momentum is you. And so now that I remembered what the second part is, I can go to that as well, which is, you know, some people just need to have a moment in time, a yay-no moment, a fancy way of saying yes-no, as I call it, where something happens. I mean, how often has something happened to you in your life where you really ignored the call? You know, something happened and you were being shown the picture and you scratched it off and said, you know, I, I don't need to look at this. I need to just stay where I am doing what I'm doing. And at some point, typically that's what happens when they come to me is they've hit that point. Someone died. They lost their job. They got divorced. They realize that going to the cubicle every single day is just killing them, uh, whatever it might be. But they, they've become really clear that they're ready to move in a different direction. Yeah. I mean, you've talked about a lot of great stuff, Steve, but I want to get, you know, just to zero in on one thing that someone could start doing right now. What's the best piece of advice you tell them, you know, wherever they're at, what should they start with? So three pieces of advice. I, I'm, I'm tough on just giving one. So let me, let me give three. Three is good. Three is good. So number one, you really got to grant yourself the time and permission to get started and discover what your what is. I mean, that's, that's number one. And I know that sounds sort of trivial, but reality is that, I mean, we're always moving and grooving and doing this, that, and the other. And we never really grant ourselves time and permission to slow down and really understand who we are. So start scheduling it. I mean, even if it's reading for a half hour a day on the bus as you go to work and a half hour home, or if it's doing meditation in the morning, or if you're a knucklehead like me and you do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which you find therapeutic, um, then, you know, you do that, but you got to grant yourself that time and the permission to say, yeah, I can go down this path. I can move in a direction where this is outside of my comfort zone. You know, and that's the thing is we live our lives in, in these restricted circles of who we believe that we are. And seldom do we break out of that mold. And so you really got to smash the rewind button and start living life on record a little bit. So grant yourself that time and permission and try something new. <laughs> I mean, to try that for a change. Uh, number two, you really got to get out of denial. 
about who you are and how you're naturally wired to excel. I mean, we make so many excuses. We don't have the time. We don't have the energy. We don't have the money. We don't have the knowledge. We don't have, uh, you know, the ability to do it. Our kids, you know, have all the things that they're doing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and, and even with Obamacare, how can I lose my health insurance? You know, I can't, I can't lose my health insurance. I mean, I get all that stuff, right? But reality is that many of us live in denial about who we truly are. And so if that's the case, you know, as I said, I mean, you're really denying others the gifts that you have. And is it hurting anyone if you, if you don't pursue your what? Well, my way of thinking, yeah, it really is. I mean, you're doing others a huge disservice by hiding in the shadows and not bringing to the world the gifts that you have and how you can be of benefit to others. And so... You know, it's really something you got to think about, which is, you know, are you in denial? And ultimately, what I like to say is that your what always has to be bigger than your butt, right? And, and I'm not talking about, of course, your butt, butt, but, you know, the excuses that we put in our own way. And so your what always has to be bigger than your butt. And then number three, you may just have to go a little farther back in your life to reconnect with what your what is, because I do believe that at some point in our lives, we were all connected to our what and then life happens and it throws you off path i mean for instance maybe when you were young you loved to paint and you had a favorite color and your favorite color was blue and your mama had a favorite color and her favorite color was white and so all of her carpet was white right and one day when you were painting the two met you know that blue paint hit the white carpet and it wasn't like one of those Reese's peanut butter cup moments of chocolate meeting peanut butter and everybody's happy when the blue paint hit the white carpet you got yelled at and you buried that to the nether regions, never to be heard from by anyone, including you, ever again. So if that's the case, I mean, you may just have to go farther back in your life to reconnect with who you truly are. So was there something early on for you that you remember that you suppressed because of what happened? You know, it's interesting. I, um, I, I think their responsibilities have a way of, just, of, of suppressing what it is that we're truly compelled to do. And so, yeah, as I began to take on more responsibilities, uh, more and more of what I would truly love to do and I'm truly wired to do got buried. I mean, I've been a, a music guy forever. I DJed in clubs for a long time. But as you have kids and you get married, you know, those, those things, something's got to give for the most part, unless you've got a very understanding wife who wants to travel with you and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, you know, as... As time has gone by, uh, you know, some of that has certainly been suppressed. I'll, uh, I'll probably get into the game a little bit more again as, uh, as my kids get a bit older. But, uh, but yeah, man, you know, it's, um, it's easy to, to fall into the trap and entrapments of responsibility. And oftentimes that's what throws most people off course. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so I want to hear about one of the best advice you've gotten from a mentor. Besides, you can always go back to pumping gas. Who is another mentor that's been really valuable for you? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of people that uh, have done amazing things and really persevered in the face of, uh, of, of everything that, that just really is, is shaping up to be a blockade from them moving forward. And so, I mean, from, from a personal standpoint in terms of mentors, uh, I just, I, I don't, I can't pinpoint one particular person. I mean, I will say that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of those who reinvent their lives or who have so much conviction mm -hmm. uh, that really nothing gets in their way. I mean, people like Jack Canfield, who started out in the city of Chicago here as a, as a high school teacher and really reinvented his life over the years to share of himself in ways that I know he never deemed possible before he headed down that path. Other people like Dr. Joe Amoya, who is a personal friend as well, uh, and, and just, I mean, just an amazing story of someone who started out as a chiropractor and went to school and had his own practice and, you know, was making really good money and woke up one day and just said, I can't do this any longer. I just, I can't keep down, keep going down this path. And, Four years later, he's known as the smarter dating guy, and he helps single women find love. You know, I didn't so, know that. Uh, yeah, I mean, so there's, there's countless examples of people that I've worked with, people yeah. that I know, 
uh, who have really just reinvented their lives and persevered when everything was stacked up against them. And so, you know, I, I wish that I could say that I'm enamored with just one particular person as a mentor. But, you know, frankly, I believe that everything and everyone that you meet has something to teach you. Right. And everyone that you meet is an expert in something. And so, honestly, I mean, I, I view young and old as, as mentors because they all teach me something. So some of the, just the, the colleagues that you have, you, you, know, you really admire what they've done and what they do. Do you remember any piece of advice like Jack Canfield's given you uh, throughout the years that's been helpful? You know, Jack is a um, – I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to call Jack a, a – personal friend and he's I mean he's an amazing guy and and really what what I learned from Jack not anything that he said to me specifically but what I've learned from Jack more than anything is that it's it's just it's so important to 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 accept what happens in life and and so many people fight what happens in life. And Jack is just, he's been always, he's been one of those people that has helped me really see the importance of accepting what, life's, what life throws at you. And it doesn't mean that you have to wallow in it, but it means that you have to relinquish control. And so one of the, the lessons that I've really taken from Jack and, and from others as well is that the more control you try to have over what goes on, the less control you, you, you really end up having. So, I mean, it's, it, it's counterintuitive. But at some point, I mean, you really just have to let go and accept things for what they are. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. I mean, that, that sticks in my mind. I remember I was on a river rafting trip, and my mom fell out of the boat, and she got swept into one of those currents under the water, and she got... Pull, pushed up, then swept back down. It was just really scary. Swept up, pushed back down, and she was just down there. And she came, finally came up. And we pulled her in the boat, and she said she just kind of, she knew the current was going to keep pulling her back, and she just kind of just let go. And mm -hmm. when as soon as she kind of let go, it just pushed her further, and she we were able to pick her up. So mm -hmm. that's what comes to my mind when you say that. It just wow. keeps grabbing you back, and then when you kind of just let go and let it happen, it just pushes you further. So yeah. um, I wanted to hear uh, about, you know, I'm always a little bit scared to ask you this because you have a very, you have a strong personality and I'm scared what you're going to say about this, but what's one of the worst pieces of advice you've gotten from someone that you found untrue? Um, you know, I got to tell you, man, I, I think that it's, it's not a particular piece of advice that has been bad. Mm -hmm. But it's more of a mentality. And I think it's really just a matter of, as you move forward, becoming very clear on who you surround yourself with and why they're a part of your life. And so it, it hasn't been bad advice per se. It's been actions that others have taken that I learned from and almost, if you will, disassociate myself with, right? Now, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I would much rather surround myself with yeah. ridiculously high achievers than people who just kind of sit back and let life rule what it is that they're going to be able to accomplish. And so I know it's it, it almost seems like this is the polar opposite now or, or clashes somehow with what I just said about Jack Canfield, but you know, reality is there's a fine line between sitting in one particular place and growing moss and continuing to move forward and try things that, that you know, frankly, you have no business trying. And those are the types of people that I like to surround myself with. And I've had to let a lot of people go over time because they just, they say ignorant shit and they do ignorant stuff. And it's just, you know, it's just a matter of you got to be real cognizant of where you invest your time, energy, and resources. And, you know, time isn't money. Time is life. Yeah. I mean, a lot of high-level entrepreneurs say that, you know, your five closest friends are your circle, and that's what most influences you. 
Um, sometimes it's easier said. How do you go about doing that? You know, some people may be watching this and say, you know, I know this one person is bringing me down. I've known him since second grade. What do you do? You stop answering the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds harsh, but, you know, reality is it's a yay, no moment. I mean, again, it's what, it's one of the seven life altering principles that you'll find in the book. I mean, it's a yay, no moment. It's that fork in the road, right? I mean, you have a choice. Right. And what you have to do is get yourself comfortable with putting yourself in position where the you of tomorrow can look back and give thanks to the you of today. And that's the reality is if when you're sitting there and, and you're about to sign a contract, you know, which, which will put you in behind 60 monthly payments uh, for, for a car that you can't afford, you know, that's a yay no moment whether or not you sign that contract. You know, no matter what the salesman is telling you, it's your choice. At that point, it's, it's up to you. It's a yay no moment. And so you have that choice with the people that you associate yourself with. And whenever you engage for an hour in a Facebook chat that's meaningless, you know, that's a choice. And for you to be resentful of someone, in other words, like let's say you have a, a meeting at 8 in the morning and your buddy invites you out to go grab a drink and you know that you're going to be out till 11 or midnight or whatever it might be and that your performance in that meeting is going to suffer uh, if you're up all night drinking with your buddy, you know, that, that's a choice. For you to be resentful of that person because they asked you to be there, I mean, that makes zero sense. And so, again, it's a matter of taking personal responsibility and understanding that you've made that choice uh, of free will. Right. And, and ultimately, it's going to be reflected in, in how that meeting goes the next day. But, you know, the, the people who are struggling with letting somebody go, it's a struggle if you make it a struggle. Yeah. So they could not pick up the phone or they could just send them a book of what is your what. Right? <laughs> they could certainly do that, <laughs> of course. But, you know, but at the same token, I mean, you don't have to be, you know, an asshole about it. I mean, you can just simply say, you know, look, man, I just I don't have time to talk right now. Let's catch up next week and and just kind of leave it at that. Or if he invites you over, and you know, there's going to be a bunch of folks uh, you know, sitting around doing coke off of hookers' butts, then you know, I mean, that, that may, if you don't want to be in that situation, then uh, that's an interesting you know, situation. Yes, you know, I, not that, I mean, I'm not saying I've ever been there, <laughs> but you know, reality is that you know, it's it's your choice, right? I mean, and that's just kind of how it works. Is you got to start with making small choices where, ostensibly, when you're at that yay no moment, you can either move down the path that leads you towards living a life that's congruent with who you inherently are or it leads you away from your true self. Yeah. And that's just something you have to begin to recognize. Yeah. Steve, there's one question I've been wondering this whole time, which I'm going to ask you. But first, I want you to tell people where can they find out more about what is your what, what's new and exciting with it. Yeah, so uh, happy to say that the book made the New York Times bestseller list. And, Congratulations. Uh, so thank you for that. So that's, uh, that's a cool thing. And uh, the book is founded. Amazon, local bookstores, etc. Uh, but if you go to, uh, I'll just put it up here again. So if you go to whatisyourwhat.com and then add a slash free. So if you go to whatisyourwhat.com forward slash free, you can pick up a, a free electronic version of the book oh, right wow. now. That's amazing. Yeah, I'll link yep. that up if you want me to, to in the, Absolutely. In the show. But it is your whatisyourwhat.com slash free. Please do. Any, anywhere else they can reach out to you, say thank you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy for people to reach out. I'm, I'm sure I've annoyed some people. Hopefully I've inspired <laughs> some people. I mean, it's just kind of how I am. Catch me on a good day and I'll only annoy you. Catch me on a bad day and I'll only inspire you. So, uh, you know, reality is that you can go to steveolsher.com, S-T-E-V-E-O-L-S-H-E-R.com. Uh, or if you have feedback, you know, I, 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 my wife hates it because she calls, she calls my, uh, my phone and my computer, my two whores. Because um, I'm like I'm always connected. So if you send me an email to Steve at steveolsher.com, uh, you know I'll I'll respond. Thanks, Steve. I love this. Um, one last question is I've been wondering. You know you do so much. You have companies you run. You have the book. You're speaking. I mean I went to one of your events that you had in Chicago too. Uh, what does a day look like for you? Uh, honestly, you're the only thing I've got on the docket today. So it's a good day right now. <laughs> What about tomorrow? What's uh, uh, let's see. So tomorrow, uh, I mean, do you wake tomorrow? up like you have kids? Like, what do you what do you I, do? <laughs> tell, tell me. Yeah, I've got a uh, as of this recording, I've got a ten year old and an almost seven year old. Okay. So, 
uh, you know, get them off to school, do the usual stuff in the morning. And, uh, and yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. I mean, I'm, I'm really in creator mode right now. So I'm creating a couple of automated programs uh, that I'll be launching online soon. I've got a year-long coaching program that uh that we're going to start launching it's only a thousand bucks and this thing's going to fly off the off the shelves because it's ridiculous what i'm going to give people over the course of a year so that's that's a big program project that i'm working on right now and um and so yeah man you know look obviously i'm being a little bit facetious i'm but just wondering reality, if you wake up you you drink a green smoothie hit the punching bag what what is the what is, what does the day look like yeah you know i uh, that's actually not a bad idea i should start doing that but no it's uh, it's a lot less boring than uh, than 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 you might think and part of the reason why it's so boring is i outsource everything you know i'm a i'm a loon that way i i try to hire employees I've, i mean i've had companies uh, but mostly I just find really good people to take the ball and run with it. And if they make money, then we all make money. And if not, then, you know, at least it's not too much brain damage on my, on my part. But, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm meeting with somebody tomorrow. We'll be meeting over at the casino for, uh, for lunch and a little blackjack and talk about, uh, and talk about internet profits live, which is the event that you attended. And that's P R O P H E T S and talk about internet profits live. Cause I'm looking for a partner on it. Uh, it's a great event, but you know, reality is that, uh, it could be even better. So I'm looking for uh, the right person to partner with on it. Yeah. What What's uh, the most important thing you've outsourced? Because it's tough to give up control, especially if you like things done a certain way. Yeah, it is. And, and so uh, anything that's really outside of my area of expertise, which is a lot. <laughs> but, you know, mostly it's the technical type stuff. Though I will say that um, I'm starting to build more of my own sites now. Uh, I'm just a glutton for punishment, dude. I mean, that's, that's the reality. So, and, and, and on the agenda here, I actually had a radio show called Reinvention Radio. Uh, I which saw I, that. Yeah, yeah. Which I just continued uh, a couple of years ago, but I'm going to relaunch that as a, as a podcast. And, uh, and so that's another thing that, uh, that I'll be doing here soon and, uh, and looking forward to getting into cool. that. But, you know, as far as like the technical stuff when it comes to, um, Putting the, the the podcast up on the server and getting it ready, and I, I mean, I'll I'll outsource that kind of stuff. Got it. Well, I promised one question, but I asked you ten more. So thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Not, Have a wonderful not, day. Well, it's yeah, been great. Man, well. Great appreciate, chatting. Appreciate you having me on, and uh, hopefully, like I said, I did more inspiring than annoying. But uh, you know, either way, at you got to be polarizing. Uh, yeah. Right. But either way, at least. Uh, at least folks know now the, uh, the gist of the message, which is that you were born to do an amazing thing. And whether you realize it or not, you are the solution to someone else's problem. And the world is waiting for you. So go out and figure out what that is and share it with Strategic Abandon. Thanks, Steve.